your estimate or your math or your research tells you this but if there isn't aggressive widespread testing and we are right now testing below our capacity mm -hmm. uh, how will we even know the numbers okay so uh, first of all we do have to expand testing massively i think everyone in the public health community has been saying this and and i think this is essential i think the private sector needs to be brought into testing right away do you think private te sector should test for free there's also a debate over that i hope they will test for free uh, or i hope they will test it at a reasonable cost uh, not for me to say but i certainly hope they'll make testing available widely and i think they'll behave responsibly i hope i mean i would hope mm -hmm. uh, Testing should be widely available, should be available to anyone with flu-like illness, whether, and that's the change in ICMR guidelines as of this and morning. And the simpler tests, it is emerging now globally. I, I was reading that, you know, Oxford University has some quicker tests. You don't have to wait as long for results. So, Barka, now. everyone has had this quicker test for the entire time. So, let me explain so this. Please, yeah, so, I there are two this. kinds of tests. Yeah. One is a test which is called RT-PCR, which basically is a genetic test to see if the virus is inside us using the you know, the, the actual genetic material. The simpler test looks for whether our bodies are developing antibodies against right. the virus. The antibody test is a much cheaper test and it's a faster test. And what and is it, a blood test? It's a blood test or a, or a, a, swap. Swap, or a, or a throat swab test, but it's not, as, uh, it's not as accurate as the RT-PCR, which is a much more accurate test, but takes much longer. Mm -hmm. We've been advocating that Let's not try to scale up this PCR test, you know, for everyone. Let's do the simpler test. Maybe there'll be a lot of false positives. People who don't have the disease that you're saying have the disease. But at least we do that. That's what Korea used. Mm -hmm. South Korea used a model. What happens if there's a false positive though? And then, then you, you do a secondary test and you okay. basically say everyone is positive. Then right. that way I'm only testing. But there are no false negatives in this? There are very test? few fewer false okay. negatives. Okay. Fewer false okay. negatives. And but, therefore you don't need, there's no kits problem with this. Yes. Is, 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 no is that the main problem. point? That's, that's the main point. So there's no kits problem because Chinese and Korean companies are making these at scale. India oh. could make this tomorrow. Wow. And yeah. I think this is a mistake. We, mm -hmm. should, we should be using that rapid test extensively and testing right now. Now, let me get to the second question, which is eventually, how would we know if 300 to 500 million people had been infected by July? Because we're not going to test 300 to 500 yeah. million people under any scenario. Yeah. For that, again, what, uh, what scientists use is something called a serological survey. So what they do is they'll take blood samples from, say, 10,000 people. India is very good at doing this kind of stuff, by the way. And will, again, look to see how many people have seroconverted. So in other words, they have the antibodies to the virus. So that means that we've been exposed and our bodies managed to fight it off. So that we will be able to verify by June or July. And we will continue doing that. In fact, that's part of our right. recommendations to government that we should do it right. because we need this into the, into the rest of the year as well. But the main reason we test, do testing at this stage is, as you correctly said, you test to find out if you're coronavirus positive so we can stay away from you and put you in sure, quarantine. quarantine. Yeah. And that was what we should have done for the last three weeks. And we just did not do that. And we're reaching the end of that window where that becomes feasible. Because at this point, if, you know, 100,000 people, 500,000 people are already infected, who do you quarantine and who do so you not? So at this point, you're saying, let's pick up the simple antibodies test. Yes. We're in the last kind of window where you still can. Yeah. And at least, even if it's a false, send the send the positives into a secondary test. Yeah. But you have some way of isolating populations. Correct. Correct. Right. Uh, I'll add to that also. There is a there is a room for testing for the elderly population. Since we know that everyone above the age of sixty five is at higher risk, what we should do is proactively test anyone above the age of sixty five that starts showing any symptoms at all, so that we can rush those people into care. And don't wait for them to be a critical case before they show up. We need to deal with all of them proactively. Okay, now let me make a contrarian argument to you. So, not exactly contrarian, but to ask what lockdown is affordable to the world and to a country like like India. And the, and let me just uh, just elaborate that a bit. I was interviewing Adar Poonawala, who heads mm -hmm. the Serum Institute. They're trying to work on building a vaccine. Like everywhere else in the world, a vaccine is going to take at least in at least eighteen months. So we have nothing this year. Mm -hmm. His question was that if you keep trading on livelihoods, mm -hmm. there is a chance that bankruptcy, I'm just quoting him verbatim, mm -hmm. that bankruptcy, crime, despair, suicide riots mm -hmm. is going to kill more people. That there is a real danger mm -hmm. of that, especially in our kind of country where the inequities are so high. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people who simply cannot afford mm -hmm. social distancing, right? So 
And then I read another article today, which basically said that we're taking draconian decisions on lockdowns in the absence of reliable data. Mm -hmm. So there is also this contrarian sort of question being raised. So I would agree with Mr. Punawala that we've got to balance what works for our population. We can't do what the US did or what um, China certainly did. First of all, there's not an authoritarian country. You can ask for a lockdown, but you might not get a lockdown mm -hmm. at all. And what are you going to do? Shoot people on streets? That's not going to happen. So I fully agree with that. I think uh, that's why I think our best strategy now is to protect the elderly mm -hmm. and the very young. We are passing the phase where this lockdown could have really happened. and it, But yet you, you did in this conversation say, let's do it immediately. I said, if we are going to do it, let's do it. I Would said, you define a lockdown? I mean, us? like a similar to what happens in Italy. Everyone stays home. Everyone stays home. That's what many states in the US are doing. California is closed. Maryland is closed. New York is closed. I, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating the lockdown in a, in a, in a political social context. I'm just saying... From the perspective of the disease, we need a lockdown. To but give the health system breathing space. It's no, no, no. It's also to, yeah, to isolate. To, to isolate and of course to give the health system breathing space so that we don't hit that peak. If that peak is only 30% as small, see, hypothetically, Barka, if we do that full lockdown in India, we would knock down the number, the peak by about 70%. 7-0? 7-0. These, these An immediate lockdown could... Immediate bring... lockdown over a two-week period could achieve that. But again, as others have said, it's not possible in India because livelihoods are at stake and you won't get compliance. So let's look at what, what is feasible in India. It's not just India. It's India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, yeah. Nepal. We're yeah. all in the same yeah. boat here. What is feasible here is simply that let us now carry out the testing. Let us identify the elderly and proactively go after the elderly and test them and also the, you know, the very young. The main thing is we should start setting up massive uh, temporary hospitals and facilities right away. Cover. I said this three weeks ago and people thought I was scaremongering and maybe they still think I do. But I think we should have entire stadia with, you know, maybe 50,000 beds in each of the major cities, maybe 100,000 beds with, you know, uh, oxygen equipment, which, you know, doesn't exist to that quantity and also with respect to, uh, to ventilators. Let us then prepare. Let us say we're going to face this big epidemic a lot of people are going to be very sick, but let's at least make sure that they don't die of it. Mm. That's what our option but, is. But, you know, India uh, has among, very, it, it has a low rate of ICU beds mm -hmm. per population. We have about 70 to 100,000. Yeah. So I'm saying compared to America, which has like, let's say 34 beds, we have 2.3 is what I read. Yep. Somewhere, please You're correct right. me if I'm wrong. You're right. Uh, what happens then? How does the ICU system cope? When you say, let's prepare for it. First of Where all, are the respirators? Where are the oxygen? We don't have enough. So I'll tell you what the other countries are doing, just so you know. Uh, even the UK doesn't have enough ventilators. The UK is, doesn't make ventilators at scale. They have requested Airbus and Rolls-Royce, which are companies that don't make ventilators, to immediately start ventilators. If, if I were in the government's place, I would have someone, uh, maybe the finance minister, call up you know, Mr. Tata and Mr. Birla and tell them the country needs this. Please make a million ventilators over the next three week period. Yeah. I am confident that they can do it. 